Hello, I'm Mark Allen Mattis, and this is the first of three panels themed American Afterlives for the Louisville Conference on Literature and Culture. Um, we put together this slate of panels uh, to generate a conversation that was really kind of ripe in the offing uh, for a conference that traditionally focused on literature and culture since 1900. But of course, um, the people gathered here today are interested in the ways that uh, specialists in a pre-1900 context uh, have a lot to offer scholars, listeners, readers, interpreters of post-1900 contexts, but it also stands to reason and is inc incredibly important to the viability of this stream uh, that post-1900 context people have a lot to teach us. And so I'm really excited about the possibility of generating a conversation across these staid chronologies, uh, something that's of course hot right now, thinking transtemporally about texts in a sophisticated way. Uh, but to actually do that in our conferencing institutions is another uh, is, is another enchilada entirely. So uh, I'm really glad that we have the chance to do this here. Um, we also hope that this will be an ongoing tradition at the LCLC. So uh, look out for future communications about uh, uh, future iterations of the conference. Uh, I want to tell our listeners who may not be in on it yet that there are two more American Afterlives panels, both which are being held in person on Saturday during the morning sessions. Uh, I am going rogue with Zoom through my own account and recording these sessions as well as projecting them out to our virtual participants so they can continue the conversation. But anyone who's joined us today, if you would like that link from my personal account, please reach out to me in the chat or you can email me at mark.mattis at louisville.edu and I can send you the link uh, so you can join us on Saturday if you can't be here in person. Uh, so today, we have four panelists uh, on the theme of remediations and transformations. Uh, the first of our panelists, and we'll just go in the order of the uh, conference schedule. The first of our panelists is Craig Carey from the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, Craig is an associate professor of English at the University of Southern Mississippi. His research and teaching focus on 19th century American literature, media theory, and game studies. His work has appeared in journals such as American Literature, American Literary History, and American Literary Realism, among others, and recent book collections on video games and literature. His paper is entitled, Pages, Platforms, Passages, The Interactive Affordances of Early American Literature. Next, we'll have Emma Butler Prost from the University of Tennessee. Emma is a PhD candidate and graduate teaching associate at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Emma's research focuses on how 19th century American authors use scenes of shared Bible reading to create a multicultural democratic space and challenge forms of exploitation and inequity. In a larger sense, she's fascinated by questions of intertextuality, the reader's relationship with the text and the power of the written word to forge relationships between readers. Third, we'll have Amy Hazel, who is an associate professor and librarian at Regis University in Denver, Colorado. She has worked in many different types of libraries, including art museums, digital archives and academic libraries. Her research spans library history, the history of the book and printing, 18th and 19th century European culture studies and 19th and 20th century American literature. Recent work includes articles such as, quote, on democracy in Charlotte's web, E.B. White and the power of the woven word and how to talk religion, the affidavit in Moby Dick, as well as the life of the language, sorry, the life of language, gesture, speech and writing and the works of Jacques-Louis David and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I probably butchered some of those names. My apologies, Amy. Her paper is titled, Making Over, Writing a Sewing in Noah Larson's Quicksand. And finally, we have Grace Bernadette McGowan from Boston University, who's a PhD candidate. Her work explores how black women writers use the classical tradition from ancient Greece and Rome, specifically iterations of the Black Venus. Her article, I Know I Can't Change the Future, But I Can Change the Past, Toni Morrison, Robin Cost Lewis, and the Classical Tradition was published in Contemporary Women's Writing under Oxford University Press in 2020. Congrats. Her work on Phyllis Wheatley Peters was awarded an honorable mention for the Mary Kelly Prize under the New England American Studies Association in 2021. And she recently created a suite of educational resources on Phyllis Wheatley Peters for the Massachusetts Historical Society, which I can't wait to use in my own teaching. So thank you for that in advance. Uh, so let's get started. Craig, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to apologize when I when I ended up drafting this. It ends up being for a, a larger general audience, I think, than than this audience in particular. So, unfortunately, I don't get into as many details as I wanted to. But 
The invitation in the CFP for Afterlives of Early American Literature is one that resonates with my scholarly and pedagogical practice as a professor of literature, media, and game studies. As one who, quote, professes criticism, to use John Gilroy's phrase, in ways that unsettle disciplinary boundaries, I constantly find myself trying to address explicitly and experimentally the underlying problem that literary study ignores in this particular historical moment at its peril the relation of literature to new media, as John Gilroy says. As Gilroy puts it in his latest book, as we and as we all can attest, the proliferation of new media has displaced literature itself from its historical position as the premier medium of entertainment and edification. And for those who study literature and the literary past, this transformation is felt even more intensely as this media condition becomes what Gilroy describes as, quote, a matter of existential concern, a crisis of legitimation in which literature continues to contract in social importance in a transformed cultural and media ecology. Published last month, Gilroy's Professing Criticism Essays on the Organization of Literary Study begins to address this problem by looking backwards, providing a sociology of literary study as a profession. Its argument is that, quote, our discipline's enthusiastic embrace of professionalism betrays an ambivalent relation to its amateur past, its earlier identity as criticism. Now, while the various threads of Gilroy's history are too many to untangle here, I think his reminder about our discipline's ambivalent relationship to its amateur past and its place within a digital media ecology is a good place to start my brief remarks on the digital afterlives of American literature in video games and interactive texts. The afterlives that I want to consider here might best be described as interactive texts that creatively adapt literary texts and literary elements and thus reconfigure our sense of what it means to read, study, and think about American literature in relation to new media, particularly video games, electronic literature, and interactive fiction. This is obviously a huge question, one that involves the many different convergences between games and literature um, as distinct media. Patrick Jagoda is one of the is among the first scholars to take this question seriously, arguing that games and literature warrant, quote, thick comparative analysis and call for comparative media studies that unsettle, complicate, and expand the domain of traditional literary studies. While methods from literary studies have been used to understand digital games, Jagoda also considers, quote, the opposite possibility that digital games might help us better understand, indeed, more actively play with the narrative texts that remain at the core of literary criticism. Digital games, he reminds us, share multiple codes, techniques, and interfaces with literary and print media, text, image, narrative, fiction, genre, but they also introduce their own formal features, including, he writes, navigable spatial worlds, hypermediated interfaces, and action-based mechanics, among others. Most importantly, digital games participate in what Noah Wardrip Fruin describes as, quote, the expression of ideas through processes, or what Ian Bogost describes as procedural rhetorics. How might Luddic processes and procedures and other formal features of games thus be used as tools, platforms, and heuristics to play with and think about literary texts and literary traditions? In other words, how do digital games and interactive texts reverse engineer literary texts, creating new forms of seeing, reading, writing, and thinking that invite thick comparative analysis. In this paper, I want to consider these questions through the pedagogical affordances of interactive adaptations. My more specific question is thus the following. How can digital games and interactive texts be harnessed to create new aesthetic, political, and pedagogical encounters with early and 19th century American literature? Are there examples of games already doing this? adapting, remixing, and playing with the material, historical, and virtual topographies of early American literature? The short answer is not many, at least not yet. The recent release of Walden, a game, an NEH-funded project led by Tracy Fullerton at USC, seems to be the exception. Game designers and DH scholars are not rushing to render early American literature into playable forms. Emily Dickinson might be popular with Swifties on TikTok and Instagram, but a video game inspired by Dickinson's lyrical poetry, Whitman's expansive and cinematic poetics, John Smith's epic drama of colonization, Mary Rowlandson's captivity, Jonathan Edwards' sermons or notebooks, Poe's gothic tales, Melville's Moby Dick, or the historical genre of slave narratives still feels like a stretch conjuring up speculative imaginaries that contradict our understanding of literature as an exclusively text-based media. What would playing rather than reading Ishmael even look like? What mechanics could be designed around the experience of captivity or slavery? 
What kind of interactive spaces or hypermediated interfaces could capture the typological method of Puritan reading? We can imagine Poe's fiction as a video game, but Anne Bradstreet's poetry or Thomas Harriet's report on the Newfoundland Virginia of, of Virginia? I suspect that for most literary scholars trained in reading texts and books, these ideas sound absurd. And if not absurd, then at least a violation of the materiality of texts and history. In digital reality, however, or at least my digital reality, many of these speculative translations and adaptations are already taking place. For each of the examples above, I could point to a digital game that has consciously or unconsciously adapted literary elements inscribed in early American literature. Some examples are public and widely distributed. Video games like Nantucket, Essex, The Whale Hunter, Emily Blaster, David O'Reilly's Whitman-esque everything, to name just a few, while others have been created by the growing number of players, designers, and artists on itch.io or less visible spaces like the literature and media classroom. In my own classes, for example, I have had the pleasure of reading multiple interactive adaptations of early American literature composed by talented student artists, designers, readers, and writers. Adaptations of indigenous creation stories, Puritan sermons, early American travel writing, canonical short stories, poems by Dickinson and Whitman, and more. One student even designed a hilarious but fascinating prototype of Bartleby the Scrivener using the RPG Maker game engine. You played as a more mobile version of Bartleby, confined to a small office space with a cast of different characters. The only dialogue option, of course, was I prefer not to. While the execution was amateur, the premise and the imagination were genius. The game playing with the trope of spatial confinement in ways that complicated the story's literal descriptions. I have witnessed multiple examples like this over the past five years, examples that have inspired more questions about literature than answers. As a whole, these experiments in literary and critical play point to values that are implicit in comparative media studies and acts of critical making. The value of remixing past and present to create alternative timelines, scales, and perspectives, of transforming literary criticism in conversation with digital media ecologies, of infusing literary study with methodologies from book history, comparative media studies, game studies, platform studies, and other materialist modes of inquiry, and perhaps most importantly, the value of recognizing the effective and intellectual power of students to express what I like to call, borrowing from Emerson, their own genius, that immeasurable and qualitative action and sensibility that mediates how they process the sensory world of impressions through creative vision and thought. Finally, these experiments offer insight into how we might imagine new afterlives of American literature while reinvigorating the arts of reading and writing across all media. Literary scholars have started to recognize how this digital media ecology not only renders literature one medium among many, but how it also reconfigures our sense of literature and literary study by remediating them through a different historical sensorium. What's really changing, in other words, is the distribution of the sensible through which we perceive and make sense of literature. What Jacques Ranciere describes as the boundaries of what is sensible, intelligible, and possible. From this perspective, digital games and interactive texts might be said to create new forms of aesthetic and political intervention, forms that redistribute our sensory experience and the perceptual coordinates that shape how we read, write, feel, and understand literature and literary history. 30 years ago, Margaret Fuller and Henry Jenkins offered their own political intervention in a curious essay entitled Nintendo and New World Travel Writing, a Dialogue. In their conversation, they made the provocative and prescient argument that video games share, quote, a logic of spatial exploration and conquest with early American travel writing. Through comparative analysis, they argued that video games and travel writing exemplify an alternative tradition of spatial stories in which navigation, exploration, conquest, and resource management organize narrative in ways that reflect their own distinct cultural, economic, and historical logics. Logics that organize narrative in ways different than plot, characterization, and other literary elements we associate with a novel. The article stands as one of the first examples of thick comparative analysis between games and literature, in this case, analysis that explores their convergence through the narrative mechanics of spatial interaction. It anticipates what today might be described as comparative media studies, but its focus on the concept of space as opposed to media materiality or the inscriptive logics of different writing machines abstracts comparative analysis in ways that today feel slightly reductive. With the hindsight of 30 years, 
we can recognize what is missing from Fuller and Jenkins' dialogue. The attention to medium-specific qualities of games and literature, which render an actualized space using different technologies, interfaces, and platforms. In my remaining time, I would like to propose the classroom as a possible space for not only staging more conversations between games and literature, but for practicing what N. Catherine Hales and Jessica Pressman call comparative textual media criticism, which they describe as a method of comparing different media forms and methodologies to investigate their respective logics and assumptions. My interest in the classroom stems from my belief in teaching as a productive site in which professors and students assign value to literature in ways that are too often neglected in scholarly debates. In their celebrated book, The Teaching Archive, A New History for Literary Study, Rachel Sogner Burma and Laura Heffernan argue that the classroom is an understudied, underarchived, and undervalued site in which our discipline's history has really been made and continues to be made. Classrooms offer us both a truer and more usable account of what literary study is and does, and of what its value is today. In classrooms, method grows, twining itself around particular texts and particular people. I could say more here, but I'm gonna skip that. On that note, let me end by carrying the metaphor even further, their metaphor of twining and, and twining and stitching together, which they use quite a bit. Let me end the metaphor by, by carrying the metaphor even further with a few quick thoughts on my pedagogical use of the digital platform Twine an open source tool for writing interactive nonlinear texts. Twine allows for linking, di linking different textual passages through hypertext, a digital affordance that allows writers and readers to play with texts, stories, and arguments in a number of different ways that remix textuality through digital and procedural rhetorics. In my survey course, American Literature One, I regularly ask students to use Twine to write and design an interactive experience that critically adapts a specific text or scene in early American literature. I asked them to exploit the interactive affordances of Twine to critically adapt, remix, and reconfigure a, the specific elements of a text. Each project includes an opening artist statement in which they explain how their choices are informed by historical and literary and cultural questions, how they use the affordances of Twine to reconstruct our sense of the literary past, and what they learned about literary study through these creative acts of deformance and critical making. One project consisted of the reader reconstructing and retelling Anne Bradstreet's The Author to her book from the perspective of the book itself, rather than the author. Through a series of player choices, readerly cuts and juxtapositions and carefully designed perspective shifts, the project foregrounded the material and effective of dimensions of the poem in a playful act of what Jerome McGann calls deformance, tapping into the language of intimacy and sensuality and breaking beyond conceptual analysis. In another project, a student drew on the choice-based mechanic of digital games to explore Walt Whitman's relationship with revision in two different editions of Leaves of Grass. Here, they played, they playfully integrated archival and poetic fragments, digital images, bibliographical details, drawing heavily on material found in the Walt Whitman archive, but reconstructing its aesthetic context. So what have I learned from these projects? Here are a few quick critical takeaways. First, the failures are as interesting as the successes. Um, in The Queer Art of Failure, Jack Halberstam Stam reveals how the performance of failure can open up alternative spaces, aesthetics, and sensations, leading us to new ways of experiencing pleasure and play. I try to encourage students to approach these projects less as coherent works than as experiments that utilize formal and material units, texts, passages, and links to complicate our relationship with words, pages, and other book historical units. Second, these projects draw attention to the effective dimensions of texts and print media precisely because they have been adapted into digital form. The affordances of Twine liberate students' conception about literary texts and create fresh opportunities for exploring what Derrida describes as the past resources of paper. Um, let me see here. I'm going to skip that. Of course, I, I talk a little bit about platform studies and its value, platform studies and book history, um, but I'm going to skip that. Of course, Twine is not a complicated black box relative to the platforms that are typically the objects of study in the field of platform studies, but the simplicity of its interface is precisely what makes it a really effective tool for teaching students how the technical constraints of a platform, be it the book, the page, or the screen, can be used to manipulate and modulate the sensory experience and affect of textuality. This kind of aesthetic and technical creativity is always already political, revealing to students how the aesthetics of politics and the politics of aesthetics 
play themselves out in the organization of various parts, spaces, positions, and perspectives. And finally, these projects provide evidence of the effective and intellectual power of student sensibility to create new paths of reading, writing, and thinking. I'm interested in how they exemplify Emerson's concept of the genius, which he reframed from the perspective of the common man, and which is which bears lots of similarities to Ranciere's later description of the equality of intelligences that underlies his radical pedagogy. In essays like The Poet and Quotation and Originality, Emerson suggests that we are informed of a writer's genius as much by what they select and remix as by what they originate. And I'll end with Emerson here. We read the quotation with his eyes and find a new and fervent sense as a passage from one of the poets well recited borrows new interest from the rendering. As the journals say, the italics are ours. Thank you. Sorry if I went a little over there, Tim. Not at all. It was great. Thank you, Craig. All right, next we have uh, Emma, Biblical Prophecy and the Legacy of the Ghost Dance in S. Alice Callahan and Leslie Marmon Silco. Emma. Thank you. Hmm. The 1890 ghost dance movement was a significant turning point in the history of Native American spirituality. It allowed Native Americans to combine aspects of indigenous practices and Christianity to form their own unique rituals. But this new wave of spiritual agency also threatened the white Christian establishment. In January 1889, a Paiute man named Wavoka had a vision in which Jesus told him that he and his fellow Native Americans could bring healing to, to the land and eliminate white colonialism's stranglehold on the United States if they all performed a ritual circle dance. This movement, which soon became known as the ghost dance, incorporated Native American practices such as ritual dancing, while also reinterpreting Christian concepts, particularly the promised return of Christ in the book of Revelation. Many ghost dance practitioners believed that Jesus had returned specifically to Native Americans this time, after um, the white world had rejected and crucified him. Wavoka's movement quickly spread from his local Nevada community to reservations across the nation. The government's suspicion that ghost dancers hope for an end to colonialism was actually a plan for armed resistance, led to increased government paranoia and policing. These tensions escalated during the Wounded Knee Massacre, when a group of Lakota Sioux, alarmed by the death of Sitting Bull and the increased government surveillance, began traveling west. When government agents arrested them and attempted to confiscate their weapons, one of the um, Lakota's guns accidentally went off, and the troops responded by swiftly massacring the entire group of men, women, and children. The rapid spread of the ghost dance across the nation, and the fact that ghost dancers appro appropriated Christian ideas without passively assimilating into white culture, posed an immediate threat to colonial control. In S. Alice, in S. Alice Callahan's 1891 novel, Wainema, and Leslie Marmon Silko's 1999 novel, Gardens in the Dunes, both authors embraced the ghost dance movement's reimagining of Christian imagery, as well as its emphasis on freedom for Native Americans to practice their beliefs as they see fit. Though white Americans have often used the Bible as a weapon of assimilation, Callahan and Silco both repurposed biblical imagery to rebuke the American government. By reclaiming scripture, these women point out that the Bible frequently condemns the oppressor, and like the many powerful empires depicted in the Bible, America too will face its reckoning if it continues to tyrannize and exploit Native Americans. S. Alice Callahan, a Muscogee Creek author, is widely recognized as the author of the first novel by a Native American woman. Her 1891 novel, Wainema, is one of the swiftest fictional responses to the Wounded Knee Massacre, as she published it only a few months afterwards. The massacre happened in, in um, November 1890, and her novel was published in spring 1891. After a novel that primarily follows a traditional romance plot, the story suddenly swerves into a direct depiction of the ghost dance and the tensions leading up to it, as well as the Wounded Knee. Because her ending differs so significantly from the rest of the novel, many scholars argue that Callahan added this ending to a mostly completed book so that she could offer her own response to the recent massacre. Callahan brings a minor character, a former white missionary to the Sioux named Carl Peterson, to Wounded Knee as a, as a witness to the massacre. Peterson's direct exposure to the carnage allows him to take on the role of a prophet, rebuking the government for its sins against Native Americans by using language from the Book of Revelation. As he surveys the aftermath, Peterson predicts this, that the same persecution that the nation has inflicted on Native Americans will come upon them in turn. Quote, yet surely will the hand of the Lord be laid heavily upon the United States government. It will surely be visited with troubles and sorrows and afflictions as it has afflicted and troubled the poor untutored savage. 
Peterson's words directly parallel God's judgment on the war of Babylon in Revelation 18. Like Peterson's prophecy, God similarly promises Babylon that she will face, quote, death and mourning and famine, as well as being, quote, utterly burned with fire. Callahan also draws attention to the bloodshed scene at Wounded Knee, as she states that, quote, everywhere is blood, blood, over everything, around everything, on everything. This emphasis on, on the blood is also prevalent in descriptions of Babylon in Revelation, where she, where she is described as a woman, quote, drunken with the blood of the saints, and that, quote, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Peterson's allusions to Babylon and future judgment in his speech cast the United States in the role of the Whore of Babylon, a reading that dramatically upends typical white interpretations of the day, which place the Catholic Church or other opposing movements in that role. Peterson's condemning prophecy suggests that God will someday come not to vindicate white Americans, but rather to avenge and defend Native Americans. Though Peterson's words carry great force and impart Callahan's own outcry against the injustice and violence of the massacre, Callahan casting a white man as her voice of prophecy rather than one of her Native American characters, such as Shekina, a Sioux woman who tended to be injured and was also present on the battlefield, is a bit of a missed opportunity. Peterson's viewpoint may persuade white readers to see Wounded Knee as the massacre that it, that it is. But this decision also unfortunately places, bi white, uh, places biblical prophetic discourse in the mouths of only white male characters and fails to acknowledge Native Americans as potential biblical interpreters. In Callahan's story, Native American freedom is ultimately beholden to benevolent white Methodists such as Peterson, rather than allowing Native Americans to maintain their own spiritual authority. The devastation of the Wounded Knee Massacre in Callahan's final pages critiques the United States' violent suppression of alternate spiritualities, but the extent of the damage perpetuates, also perpetuates the vanishing Indian trope, as Callahan indicates that the massacre has brought an end to the ghost dance and may soon bring an end to Native Americans altogether. At the very end of the book, Chikina prophesies that, quote, the, the Indian will be a people of the past because Native Americans cannot endure oppression like Wounded Knee for much longer. This prophecy also carries the implication that most Native Americans died in the massacre, which wasn't true, obviously, and the few and that few are left at this point. Although Chikina um, invokes the vanishing Indian, Callahan depicts Native Americans as martyrs so that, she, so that she can call white people to account for their injustice. As Janet Dean points out, Callahan refuses to allow, quote, the happy ending to wipe away responsibility for past and, and future suffering. In representing peaceful ghost dancers violently exterminated by belligerent American troops, Callahan's novel replicates the imagery of Babylon's unjust slaughter of the saints. But this depiction implies that Wounded Knee ended both the ghost dance and most Native, Native Americans as well, a depiction that Gregory Smoke notes is common in historical accounts and the popular imagination. Uh, moving forward about 100 years um, to Leslie Marvin Silco, uh, there's no definitive record that Leslie Marvin Silco read Wynema but she did do extensive research, research in writing gardens in, in the dunes, which is a historical fiction about the ghost dance. And um, to me, there's a lot of parallels that um, seem that respond to what Callahan is writing about. Um, and so Dark Gardens in the Dunes seemingly responds to many of the oversights in Callahan's novel. Silco points out that Native Americans can and have used the Bible to resist white oppression, but she also shows readers how Native Americans incorporated scripture into their spiritual landscape during the ghost dance and continue to do so today. Silco acknowledges the white abuses of the Bible while showing the ways that the Bible can foster community between Native American women and also produce change. In this novel, biblical imagery and Native American spirituality fuse together. Silco's characters acknowledge the ghost dance messiah as both the biblical Jesus and a Native American man who has returned to his own people. In sharp contrast to Callahan, who depicts the Wounded Knee Massacre as a tragic end to the ghost dance movement, Silco actually sets her story a, a few years after Wounded Knee and showcases the ghost dance as an ongoing movement. This continued revival of the ghost dance even after Wounded Knee reminds readers that Native American spirituality is resilient and the massacre cannot kill the ghost dance entirely. To accompany this image of, of a persistently regenerating ghost dance, Silco's characters believe that the ghost dance Jesus is similarly unkillable because he escaped crucifixion and continues to evade contemporary persecution from the military. Quote, after the Pharisees tried to have Jesus killed, he left the Sea of Galilee to return to the mountains beyond Walker Lake where he was born. 
Silco's protagonists, Indigo and Sister Salt, maintain their belief in their own Native American interpretation of Jesus, even in the face of religious institutions that reject the ghost dance Messiah, or attempts by well-meaning white people, such as Indigo's temporary guardian, Hattie, to reframe her worldview into a more traditionally Christian understanding of Jesus and his ministry. During an interview with Ellen Arnold, Leslie Marvin Silco discussed her desire to use this novel to validate the ghost dance interpretation of Jesus as a sincere belief system, as opposed to accounts presenting it as a non-canonical offshoot of Christian practice. And those kind of um, reports go back to even when people were reporting on the ghost dance in the 1890s. A lot of people were saying like, oh, these ghost dancers just don't understand Christianity. They've misunderstood the Bible um, instead of seeing it as a unique practice. So Silco says, quote, the Jesus or Messiah of the ghost dance and some of the other sightings of the Holy Family in the Americas were just as valid and powerful as other sightings and visions of Jesus. Silco showcases her characters maintaining their own belief in the ghost dance Jesus as a form of resistance to legalistic church doctrines. Quote, Sister Salt didn't believe anything the churchgoers said because they were wrong about Jesus Christ. They claimed he died on a cross long ago, but Sister saw him with her own eyes last winter. Both Indigo and Sister Salt find strength through their worship of an unkillable Jesus, and his presence inspires them to continually revive the ghost dance in spite of white opposition. Like Callahan, Silco also repurposes the Bible to challenge white oppression, but instead of limiting, limiting scripture to white interpretations, she places the Bible firmly in the hands of Native American women. Sister Salt and her two roommates, Vedna and Metha, turn to the Bible's prophetic passages and incorporate Bible reading into their larger spiritual practice. One of the first instances of this shared participation in scripture occurs when Vedna flips open her Bible to the story of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. Vedna reads the passage only for Metha to observe that the Valley of Dry Bones mirrors their current dismal living arrangements. Quote, the hand of God was upon me and carried me out and set me down in a Valley of Dry Bones. That's right, Metha interrupted, we live in that valley. Metha's comment that they live in the same valley as the one mentioned in Ezekiel, removes the Bible from its historical association to instead envision it as a commentary on their present location and circumstances. When Vedna reads about how the bones are restored to life and given new flesh, Sister Soul directly applies this passage to her belief in the ghost dance. Quote, here it was even in the Bible. Everything Wafoka said was true. With winds from the four directions scouring the earth, their slain ancestors would rise up into armies. The Bible supports the restoration promised by Wavoka, and this moment allows the women to incorporate Bible reading into their spirituality. Later in the book, Vedna offers to consult the spirits on behalf of an injured Hattie, and she mediates this communication with the spirits through reading the Bible. Vedna's attempt to consult the spirits brings the group to another passage from Ezekiel, promising the writer that he will see, quote, greater abominations than these. And the women surmise, May, quote, maybe it's about us. Ezekiel's trying to warn us. In the midst of a world where the, where the church abuses biblical discourse and the government ende endeavors to shut down Native American spiritual rituals, these women are able to turn to the Bible and find truths within, within its pages that apply directly to them and their current circumstances. In the final pages of the book, Silco shows how Native Americans can use the Bible to rebuke white abuses and defend their own beliefs. Once Indigo is reunited with her sister, the group of women attempt to revive the ghost dance in the hopes of bringing back their mother, who disappeared years ago um, during a police raid. In a, in a repeat of the first police raid, the police once again interrupt the ghost dancers before they can complete the final night of dancing that will bring restoration to the land. The dancers are all disappointed that they cannot complete their ritual, and Vedna uses the Bible to resist the police officer's oppression. Quote, Vedna brought out her Bible and waved it in the cops' faces. The soldiers moved in on their um, horses to protect the cops, but Vedna stood her ground and let the Bible fall open, then began to shout out the words on the page. Even though you make many, many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Vedna reads Isaiah as a direct commentary on the advancing troops and their religious persecution, and then weaponizes, weaponizes the scripture to decry the soldiers' attempts to shut down the ghost dance. Silco adds that Vedna's defiant Bible reading, reading empowers her, when other ghost dancers are fearful of the police officers. Quote, many people were crying and all appeared stunned. Only the girl with the Bible appeared to resist. Vedna's resistance does not prevent the officers from putting an end to the dance and forcing everyone to return to their reservations. But Silco's scriptural references in this moment showcase the power of using biblical prophecy to challenge white oppression. Vedna uses a sacred text that these officers presumably follow to remind them that their actions would cast them as biblical villains and that God does not heed the prayers of the oppressor. Silco shows how Native American spirituality remains resilient in the face of oppression. 
Though the ghost dance is shut down twice, the government's interference does not dampen Indigo or Sister Salt's belief, suggesting that the dance may return in the future. Silco depicts characters who willingly integrate the Bible into their worldview because they do not see other religious identities or races as a threat to their spiritual practices, and consider the ways that outside views can even enhance their own beliefs. At the same time, these characters resist imposed beliefs and assimilation, demonstrating an eagerness to use the reclaimed Bible to defend their spiritual practices from American domination. This fragile balance between cultural change and indigenous resistance highlights Native Americans' ability to dismantle the Bible's role as, a, as an assimilationist tool and redirect it against colonial powers. The Bible presented to Native Americans often came loaded with America's expectation that receiving Christianity would civilize and pacify them so that the government could dominate them with ease. But despite the Bible's abuse of presence in Native American circles, Alice Callahan and later Leslie Marvin Silco present an evolving perspective on the way that Native Americans can reclaim the Bible and invoke the prophetic voice to protest injustice and demand equal spiritual sovereignty. Though these works cannot undo the damage wrought at Wounded Knee, Callahan and Silco demonstrate that it is possible to use the Bible to move forward in pursuit of greater religious and spiritual freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Amy. Writing is sewing in Noah Larson's quickstand. Please. Thank you. So making over, writing as so, uh, sewing in Nella Larson's quicksand. Nella Larson, Harlem Renaissance writer, published her first novel, Quicksand, in 1928, not long after quitting her role as a librarian. I don't know why anyone would ever do that. Just kidding. Um, to devote herself to writing full time. This proved fruitful. She published her second novel, Passing, a year later. And on the heels of this publication, Larson applied for a Guggenheim, listing her occupations as hack writing, housework, sewing. Why did Larson, a critically acclaimed writer by profession at the time she applied for the grant, list these occupations? Previously, I've looked at how and why Larson might use the word hack to describe her writing. Today, I continue this exploration of Larson's Guggenheim application, examining the final occupation Larson listed, sewing. Through a close reading of Quicksand and in concert with some biographical details, I argue that Larson's writing and revising process suggests the activity of sewing, nodding to the materiality of the text and the labor involved in writing. Quicksand opens with a layered description of the light and shading, the colors and decor that surround the main character. Quote, Helga Crane sat alone in her room, which at that hour, eight in the evening, was in a soft gloom. Only a single reading lamp, dimmed by a great black and red shade, made a pool of light on the blue Chinese carpet, on the bright covers of the books which she had taken down from their long shelves on the white pages of the open one selected, on the shining brass bowl crowded with many colored nasturtiums beside her on the low table and on the oriental silk which covered the stool at her slim feet. It was a comfortable room furnished with rare and intensely personal taste, flooded with Southern sun in the day, but shadowy just then with the drawn curtains and single shaded light." End quote. From this opening scene, a room rich with color and texture, we turn to the second paragraph of the novel to meet the main character. Quote, an observer would have thought her well fitted to that framing of light and shade, a slight girl of 22 years with narrow sloping shoulders and delicate but well-turned arms and legs in vivid green and gold negligee and glistening brocaded mules, deep sunk in the high in the big high back chair against whose dark tapestry, her sharply cut face with skin like yellow satin was distinctly outlined. She was, to use a hackneyed word, attractive, end quote. From these opening lines of the novel, we are guided by Larson to consider materiality, clothing, furniture, drapes, decor. Larson biographer, George Hutchinson, writes that Larson's novels give, quote, lavish attention on the details of women's dress and other fabrics. 
and that she uses the imagery of fabric throughout her novels. And indeed, the second paragraph of the novel invokes the imagery of fabric, quote, skin like yellow satin, and continues to offer great detail in color and texture. Note also in these opening lines of the novel, Larson uses the word hackney to describe Helga, which is a version of the same word she uses on the Guggenheim application just to describe her writing, hack. To hack is to cut. Cutting fabric is an initial step in the process of sewing. The term hack is also related to the word hew, to cut with an ax. Hewing mimics in all but the first letter that same occupation that Larson listed on the Guggenheim application, sewing. We have just seen an example of the ways in which Larson's writing is attentive to the details of fabric, hinting at this occupation of and with sewing. Hutchinson, who has noted this, also tells us that Larson was an accomplished seamstress. Quote, Nella Larson was an expert at making over dresses as an adult, through her, though her formal schooling never included instruction in sewing. End quote. Hutchinson continues citing the impact of Larson's sewing skills on her writing. Quote, a woman's ability to dress herself in garments of her own choosing would always signify in Larson's fiction, her freedom and personal agency. Larson's love of fabric and what could be done with it, the comforts it afforded derived from her youth when her mother taught her to cut, fit, and sew, end quote. Let's begin this examination of the occupation sewing in quicksand by considering how Larson cuts, fits, and sews in her writing. We have learned that Helga has come to her room to quote, intentionally isolate herself and to read her own books. But what exactly is she escaping from? Shortly after we meet Helga, we learn that she is removing herself from the community she is a part of. She is tucked in her room in order to escape the confines and in Larson's description, quote, the strenuous rigidity of conduct required in the huge educational community that she is part of as a faculty member, a school called Naxos. Helga likes to be alone. She likes richly colored fabrics and luxurious fabrics as well. And she likes books. And in particular, though, her own books, which bring pleasure and escape. By contrast, her Naxos readings are merely, quote, school teacher paraphernalia, which we witnessed Helga throw, quote, violently, scornfully towards the wastebasket. This paraphernalia is associated with, to use Helga's word, the Naxos products churned out of the school, which Helga thinks is less like a school, more like a machine. By contrast, Helga's books are associated with freedom from the drab books of the school. Naxos, as Larson has depicted it, is a machine-like place, quote, cutting all to a pattern, the white man's pattern. The school, quote, tolerated no innovations, no individualisms. By retreating to her room with her own decor, her own clothing, her own books, Helga chooses not to be cut to the pattern of the school, thus, just as Larson experienced freedom and fabric in selecting and making her own clothes, here Helga finds freedom in the retreat from the school to her own room, a setting she has created with her own fabrics and objects. It is not only the school and the materials associated with Naxos that Helga is distancing herself from, but in particular, an event that occurred earlier that evening. She has been she has become disgusted with the words of the quote, renowned white preacher who is speaking to the Naxos students in a way Helga finds demeaning and offensive. Quote, Helga shuddered a little as she recalled some of the statements made by that holy white man of God to the black folk sitting so respectfully before him. The preacher, Helga scornfully remembers, suggested that all Black folk should take a leaf out of the book of Naxos and conduct themselves in the manner of the Naxos products in order to eradicate the race problem, end quote. The white preacher's comments continue to irk Helga, so much so that even her concerted effort 
to escape his words by retreating to her room and reading a book of her own choosing is futile. Quote, she pinned a scrap of paper about the bulb under the lamp shade. For having discarded her book, she wanted an even more soothing darkness. Again, we see Larson depicting Helga seeking and creating a setting of her own. In this moment that Larson depicts through the imagery of sewing, Helga asserts her own volition. She does not, quote, take a leaf out of the book of Naxos, but instead takes the refuse, that school teacher paraphernalia thrown into the wastebasket. She takes a scrap of paper and pins it to the underside of the lampshade, just as a seamstress might take a paper pattern and pin it to the fabric before cutting and sewing. Helga wields the freedom to make over her space with the tools and skills of someone who is familiar with the steps of sewing, selecting a pattern, pinning the pattern to the fabric, cutting the fabric, and sewing the pieces together. The freedom Helga finds by making over her room with this little scrap of paper affixed to the lampshade is similar to Larson's making over of clothing. Larson, as Hutchinson describes, would obtain used clothing and then cut, form, and sew to create a piece of clothing uniquely her own. Another Larson biographer, Thaddeus Davis, indicates that Larson's writing process was very similar and that she often started with something quite elemental and then she would work over, embellish, and add detail. Davis continues indicating that Larson's drafts came easily to her, but that her editing was long involved and very labor intensive. In particular, Davis writes that, quote, in the revisions of her novels, Larson took her previous compositions and her readings into account in an effort to produce the most effective fiction she could. Her practice was to layer physical details and psychological motivations into her stories after she had first sketched her plot and characters. Thus, when she counted only five weeks for writing Quicksand, she had actually spent almost two years on it. So while Larson's draft, uh, sorry, missed my spot. As Davis describes it, quote, she had developed the manuscript by 21,000 words, increasing it from 35,000 to 56,000. The substance and style then of that initial draft changed significantly over the two years of editing. Larson had made over her initial draft working diligently for two years to get it to the state. When she submitted this version to Knopf, they responded within a week that they would publish Quicksand. Larson was thrilled to learn that Knopf would publish this first novel as she carefully vetted publishers and selected Knopf as a publisher worthy of her work. Larson chose Knopf because of its prestige. Quote, it was the preeminent American publisher of modern fiction, whereas other publishers had a reputation for re reprinting classics, publishing sex books, or something just too conventional. But quote, Knopf was easily the most prestigious for a debut novel. It was also packaged handsomely, end quote. The package or product that Quicksand became once printed bound, covered, it was very important to Larson. Davis describes the first edition of Quicksand and Larson's pleasure with it. Quote, attractively bound in orange cloth with a border trim, Quicksand was, as Larson had hoped, another of Knopf's beautiful books. Knopf's attention to detail that she observed when considering possible publishers was evident. The title page was printed with two ink colors. The text was handsome and readable, end quote. Larson was attentive to the content of her books, but also the materiality of her books. Working with Knopf allowed her book to enter the marketplace as a beautiful object. Though absolutely interested in the materiality of books and dependent on selling her books in order to make a living, Larson was also concerned with wielding creative freedom in her writing. Davis writes that Larson, quote, saw herself as an artist, not a propagandist, and that on the heels of publishing Quicksand, Larson wrote that, quote, 
Knopp had made her promise to do two more manuscripts, but Larson asserts, quote, neither is to be of the propaganda type, end quote. As a black novelist working with white publishers, Larson was concerned with the pressure to turn out the expected through constant reminders of the tactile, fabric, tapestry, clothing, decor, drapes, carpet. Larson reminds us of the materiality of the text itself, the object we hold in our hands, that handsome package that Larson took so much pleasure in. These reminders of texture are of course also reminders of touch and of the hand involved in the work of writing. Asserting the handiwork, the process and labor of writing in her novel with the imagery of sewing is a reminder of the creator, of the novelist. Larson's occupation with the activity and skill of a seamstress is sewn into the fabric of the novel itself. I posit then that Quicksand is a novel about the process of writing by way of sewing. It is a novel preoccupied with the activities of a seamstress, cutting, forming, sewing. Previously, critics have noted that this novel exposes the binds of race and gender through the novel's Black female protagonist, Helga Crane. Critics have also offered intertextual analysis, showing the ways in which works by other authors are referenced by Larson throughout the novel. Both of these readings of Quicksand contribute to the argument that Larson was portraying the cultural and psychological complexities of the life of a Black woman in the early 20th century America. Today, what I've hoped to do is to contribute to that discussion by showing the ways that Quicksand is a book about sewing and thus reveals the ways this activity informed Larson's writing. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. And finally, we have Grace, Age of Phyllis, revisiting the classical transformations, transformations of Phyllis Wheatley Peters in the 21st century. Thank Grace, you. please. I actually have a slideshow, so I'm gonna- Yay! You guys. Um, okay. So when Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and I'm gonna go back and forward because I'm trying really hard to say Phyllis Wheatley Peters now, um, but if I say Phyllis Wheatley, you know I'm who I'm talking about. When Phyllis Wheatley Peters published Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral on the 1st of September, 1773, it made her the first person of African descent to publish a book of poems in the Americas. Her specific adaptations of classical texts from antiquity began a tradition of black women's writing in America that critiqued, influenced, and reclaimed American ideas of aesthetics. Crucially, her work also made claims for particularly American literature, challenged who could be thought of as a neoclassical poet, and influenced debates around freedom, democracy, and slavery in America. As an enslaved African woman writing on the edges of the British Empire during a moment of schism in the American Revolution, her poetry deftly critiques political systems that allowed for the existence and the continuance of the institution of slavery. I'm Did sorry, Grace, to interrupt you. I apologize. Uh, we just got to note that we need to enter full screen mode to see your presentation. So I think you just have a button to click. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we are. Thank you so much. I might have to, can, sorry, one second. Let me stop sharing. I need to do that first, I think, so then I can see my notes. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, present the screen. Okay. This is where the magic of editing is going to enter in when so, we process so. the video as well. So. I even practiced yesterday. So All you guys, good. you can't see my notes now, right? Okay, great. Um, so writing during a moment of schism, during the American Revolution, her poetry deftly critiques political systems that allowed for the existence and continuance of the institution of slavery. Today, I'm using my own framework of transformative classicism to discuss the afterlives of Phyllis Wheatley Peters' work uh, alongside what Zadia Hartman called the long afterlife of slavery. Transformative classicism, as I define it, holds that Black women writers used classical themes of metamorphosis in their writing. This can span from the literal changing forms of reworking classical genres to reflect their experiences as Black women in America, to the transformations of people to objects and objects into people that take place within the texts. These texts rework classical myth to interrogate the consequences of objectification. 
In Poems on Various Subjects, which is coming up on its 250th anniversary this year, Wheatley Peters illustrates herself as carrying out the Virgilian Rhoda, a poetic progression associated with the Roman poet Virgil, which maps the progression from writing relatively simple pastoral poetry to writing national epics, where Virgil wrote to confer cultural legitimacy on the Roman Empire and the Latin vernacular as the natural successors to the high art of ancient Greece, Wheatley Peters makes a claim for the cultural legitimacy of literature and aesthetic production from the American colonies as a natural successor to the arts and letters of the British Empire. At the time of writing and publication, the American colonies were on the cusp of a revolutionary schism that would separate them from the British metropole. Her poetry offers impetus for a rethinking of who should be granted the name of American, just as she rethinks who could be thought of as a neoclassical poet. In terms of transformation, metamorphosis, and changing forms, Wheatley Peters reworked the classical genres of panegyric, apillion, and the epistle. For the purposes of this presentation, I will only be focusing on the apillia, particularly the example of Niobe in distress. Apillia are poems that resemble the epic tradition in terms of style, content, and their use of poetic devices, but they don't reach the length of epic poetry. Therefore, although Wheatley Peters never wrote a long epic poem, her apilia do function as a gesture towards her poetic capabilities, and it's worthwhile to read them as trials for how she would have handled writing a national epic, and therefore her views on what America, the nation, and an American literary product might have looked like. Wheatley's second apilia is fully titled, Niobe in Distress for Her Children, Slain by Apollo, from Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book Six, and from a view of the painting of Mr. Richard Wilson. It's a bit of a mouthful. This poem loosely illustrates the themes of transformative classism that Wheatley Peters' poetry is engaged in, as it draws on a tale of Ovidian metamorphosis, but also opens the ground for, for considerations of aesthetic objectification. I want specifically to draw your attention to how the representation of the petrification, the objectification, literally becoming object of Niobe, the subject and central um, protagonist, informs Wheatley Peters' transformative classicism, her attitudes towards objectification, and her aesthetic ambitions. Ovid's themes of physical transformation were often being parodied to comic effect in the 18th century, and Wheatley Peters could have encountered these illusions in, for example, Alexander Pope, 1712 mock epic The Rape of the Lock, in which maids turned bottles call aloud for corks. But Wheatley Peters' Ovid is a much more serious exploration of the experience of physical transformation along, rather than these ribald burlesques. Hers is much more likely to invoke pathos than bathos. Where other 18th century writers exploited the themes of Ovidian transformation to undercut the potential for change in terms of social mobility, character reform, or political revolution, Wheatley Peters meditates on the myths with a seriousness that speaks to her preoccupation with the concept of transformation from subject to object. In the myth, Niobe is represented as being too proud of her children, invoking the wrath of the gods, who then kill all of her children while she watches. After her children are killed, Niobe returns to her homeland, where she petrifies, transforming into a stone statue forever weeping and mourning the loss of her children eternally. Phyllis Wheatley Peters opens her version of the poem with the following. Apollo's wrath to man the dreadful spring of ills and numerous tuneful goddess sing, right? You can hear that like epic tone, right? Epic allusion. Thou who didst first the ideal pencil give and taught the painter in his works to live, inspire with glowing energy of thought what Wilson painted and what Ovid wrote. Muse lend thy aid, nor let me sue in vain. This ekphrastic poem is deeply concerned with artistry on the epic scale. The aesthetic endeavors of the pencil, as a metonym for the poet Ovid, and by extension, Wheatley Peters, are shown to be animating ones. Um, the painter is able to achieve immortality in his works to live, but also to bring that work to life. So in short, this poem is a story about a queen, a subject who turned into an object, a stone statue, and then reanimated by artistic power. And the final stanza of the poem is actually accompanied in the printed version, the first version by an asterisk that informs the reader that this verse to the end is the work of another hand. But it reads, the queen of all her family bereft without husband, son or daughter left, grew stupid at the shock. The passing air made no impression on her stiffening hair. The blood forsook her face amidst the flood poured from her cheeks, quite fixed her eyeballs stood. Her tongue, her palate both obdurate grew, her curdled veins no longer motion knew. The use of neck and arms and feet was gone, and even the boils hardened into stone. A marble statue now the queen appears, but from the marble steal the silent tears. <laughs> 
Niobe becomes a stone queen, literally objectified from a living woman to a statue and a monument to mourning and death. This apelia is therefore concerned materially with this analog of American nation building, particularly the people who are becoming transfigured in its wake. Wheatley Peters gained her legal freedom after the publication of her poetry collection. In many ways, her poetry and the classical learning it exemplified made her a transatlantic celebrity, particularly among abolitionists. And so it contributed to her gaining of her legal freedom. Her neoclassical poetry played an important part in her own legal transformation from object or property to free person and subject. But this transformation was not uncomplicated as Phyllis Wheatley Peters ultimately was unable to ever publish a second volume of poetry and died financially destitute and is buried somewhere that is lost to us. And so this presentation is supposed to be about afterlives. In 2020, Honoré Fanon Jeffers published her poetry collection, Age of Phyllis, which is a, a, a speculative reimagining of the life of Phyllis Wheatley Peters and her contemporary moment. The poetry collection begins with Wheatley Peters's life in Africa before her abduction and forcible transportation and follows her throughout her life to her death in 1784. Jeffers reconstructs Wheatley Peters's life and times from the fragments available to us in the archive. In Book Passage, the first poem here, Blues Odysseus, imagines Wheatley Peters's voyage um, as part of the transatlantic slave trade and alludes to her burgeoning classicism. Jeffers refers to the transatlantic slave trade and the loss of life while it operated. How many sat underwater entangled by myths past tense before Neptune first raised his beard in the direction of Ethiopia and after Odysseus, always living, was saved by Homer's tablet. Centuries after that story was written in the land of not make-believe, a crew of slave ship sailors threw 132 Africans into the Atlantic Ocean. Odysseus is depicted as always living or immortal, unlike those who are unnamed and are thrown into the ocean from the slaver in a reference to the slave ship Zong, which in 1781 ordered that the enslaved people, the enslaved people on board be thrown over to save provisions. Odysseus is saved by Homer's tablet, his immortality assured by poetry and etched in the stone. Jeffers repeats later in this poem, Odysseus lives, he always will, our great white hope, tying the maritime myth of Odysseus in the classical tradition to the inhumanity of the Middle Passage and the events aboard the slave ship song, and importantly, to the American literary tradition, particularly Herman Melville's Moby Dick with its central metaphor of the great white whale. What is highlighted here, what Jeffers is really doing, it's making obvious who can and cannot be saved by the classics. As a companion piece later in her collection, Jeffers has a poem called Blues Yumoja. This poem centers the water spirit of Yoruban religious tradition as a pairing with Odysseus. Yumoja is the mother of all the Orishas. Jeffers combines the Greek classical tradition with the Yoruban spiritual and religious tradition from West Africa, and the maritime theme that runs throughout both poems is emphasized when Jeffers writes that mm. the drawing ones become sculptures of memory. Oh, the dead become monuments to memory and loss without their graves being properly marked. Jeffers problematizes how far transformative classicism can help or save a person. She also draws attention to the insidious ways transformative classism can actually be turned back against Black bodies to transform them legally into objects. In Phyllis Peters prepares this proposal to publish a second book, which is near the close of Jeffers's collection, she imagines the life that Wheatley Peters might have led after her emancipation. The final lines read, Behold the Negro poetess, she that once clung to stone, turned now a discarded rock, yet Phyllis Peters still knows her fine mind, the sable genius turning on words. These lines read in place of an epitaph for Wheatley Peters. Jeffers calls on her readers to witness or behold, um, despite the transformation into a discarded rock, an allusion to the lack of a grave marker for Wheatley Peters. Wheatley Peters is a stone statue like Niobe, but her monument is lost or discarded like so many in Blue's Odysseus, whose graves are unmarked as they are thrown into the sea and unremarked upon. But her memory and her work survive in her poetry. The writings of Phyllis Wheatley Peters have assured her immortality, but not her accessibility to us in our time. There's still so much we don't know and seem unlikely to ever know about her. But in reimagining her life from archival fragments, Jeffers enters a reconstructive project in keeping with the Black womanist classical tradition that was launched by Wheatley Peters herself in 1773 with the publication of this book. And Jeffers isn't the only poet who is concerned with the limits of transformative classicism as it pertains to Wheatley Peters. 
In 2019, as part of the 1619 project for the New York Times, Eva Ewing wrote the poem 1773, which specifically addresses the lack of a formal gravesite memorial for Wheatley Peters and the constantly ambiguous role of the classical tradition in her writing, first as an enslaved person and then as a free Black person in North America. The poem opens with this centralizing verb, pretend, pretend I was there with you. And Ewing engages in the theoretical methodology coined by Sadia Hartman as critical fabulation. Ewing deftly underlines the ways in which a classical tradition was used by Wheatley Peters as a claim for personhood and as an enslaved African woman, as well as for her authorship and literacy. But Ewing highlights the importance of Ovid to Wheatley Peters' work and crucially prompts the reader to question just how far transformative classics can take a person, reminding us that ultimately Wheatley Peters died without financial stability and without a marker for her grave. Pretend I was there with you, Phyllis, when you asked in a letter to no one, how many I am's to be a real human girl, which turn of phrase evidence is a righteous heart. If I know of Ovid, may I keep my children. Phyllis Wheatley Peters' poems on various subjects, religious and moral then, was a seminal publication which launched multiple literary canons, made claims for particularly American literature, and challenged who could be thought of as a neoclassical poet, alongside influencing debates around freedom, democracy, and slavery. The publication of her poetry in a format and style that closely associated it with translations of works from antiquity argued strongly for Wheatley Peters' place in the canon. The classicism in the publication was an experiment not only in legitimizing the work of African descended people in the Americas, but in shaping what the very concept of an American literature and an American citizen could and should be. The existence of this book is a first in many ways, and its exploration of the literary tradition and Wheatley Peters' own place in it have reverberating consequences for what we think of that tradition today. It has also spawned a reception field of its own where writers and scholars continually revisit the transformations of the revolutionary era, both those of the nation and those of the people living within it and living within what Christina Sharp calls the wake, or again, what Hartman calls the long afterlife of slavery. The afterlife of slavery is what haunts the afterlife of Phyllis Wheatley Peters' work, and we cannot find her grave now. We can only find her in the objects and the monuments, such as this one, which is in Boston, the Women's Memorial or this one that I find outside of London. We can only find the Phyllis Wheatley Peters that is carved from or in stone, her likeness transfigured to a sculpture forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Excellent, excellent presentations all. I thank you so much for sharing your, your work today. Um, I have a, a range of questions for all, all our, excuse me, a range of questions for all our presenters, uh, but, I hope that, and I'll get the ball rolling here, but I hope that you'll take this moment, dear audience, uh, to uh, proffer some comments in the chat box, or if you want to raise your hand or wave, gesticulate wildly, uh, we'll hear your question. Uh, but I'll get it started. Um, I noticed a kind of interesting continuity uh, where we had this transformation from Craig's paper, which was deeply focused, right, on the way in which interacting with the affordances of new media, particularly video games and design, uh, gives us a purchase on uh, narrative, on aesthetics, on even uh, early American media themselves and their affordances. Uh, and it was a paper that I like to think of in terms of Lisa Gittleman's uh, lovely phrase from always already knew that media limit and delimit representing, um, that they are both, right, um, that which stands between our encounter with the text, but also um, is that through which we encounter the text in the first place, especially across time, right? So there are media in their historical context and then the media we use to engage those historical media, and they both make an interpretive like, difference. Um, uh, in the case, of Emma's paper, uh, we see these invocations of media representing and limiting representation. Uh, there, that's the quote. Um, uh, in the case of the embodied performance of biblical exegesis, and then the remediation of that biblical exegesis through the ghost dance in both the level of genre of the novel, but also the book format. And then we come full circle to the way in which books are engaged at the level of plot. And so we have this movement from uh, technological affordance to we'll call it good old fashioned close reading. Uh, we see this move even more so uh, in our paper on 
uh, Nella Larson by, by Amy, uh, where we have uh, a person working through Larson, self-consciously working through status as an author, uh, her status as a black woman, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a working within a white infrastructure of print, trying to think through how her aesthetic sensibilities about you know metaphors of sewing as writing, about metaphors, uh, material metaphors reflecting on metaphors of elements of fiction, including obvious like symbolically rich moments like light and dark, right? And so we're getting closer to the way in which the material matters of media transform our relationship to aesthetics, whether as authors or as readers of those uh, self-conscious moments of authorship. And then of course, we have a full-blown uh, paper on authorship. And then you might say the remediation of what it means to be an author and be heard and known uh, and interpreted and how much control one does or does not have over that fact of wanting to proffer ideas out into the world, but nonetheless, always subject and particularly so in the case of uh, BIPOC people and especially people who are enslaved of not being rendered mere object in the act of uh, whether knowing in the present of the 18th century or the fantasy of recovery in the 21st. So I was wondering um, if each of you could reflect on the way in which, in the case of Craig, the way in which uh, technological affordances uh, have helped you or your students think through particular narrative moments uh, in particular novels or particularities of Whitman's uh, aesthetics of the merge of I and you. Um, and on the opposite of the end of the spectrum, and this is really for everyone, but on the opposite of the end of the spectrum, uh, Grace, how your encounter with the material texts of Wheatley's works, as well as I think the orthographically, spatially typeset, amazing work that Jeffers is doing, uh, informs how you read her reflections on the fantasies of recovery when the objectification uh, that's inherent in any transformation that relies upon an aesthetic of the colonizer. I mean, I'll answer, I'll answer really quick and just be, and just be quick. I mean, one of the interesting things about interactive fiction, of course, is that the vast majority of times when you encounter an interactive fiction work, it'll use the second person um, pronoun you, right? To draw the reader in to an experience. And that's something you see kind of played out in the history of interactive fiction. Obviously people ex people experiment with different kind of um, pronouns, but, but the you seems to be a big one. So even something as simple as that, right? Often will engage students to think about the ways in which Whitman um, historically is using the eye. Like when we look at his notebooks and we think about the way the eye functions as kind of like a proto camera that is able to kind of gather different fragments together. Um, and he's able to almost kind of convert his notebooks into a database, you know, as, as other scholars have argued, that in some respects, that kind of logic plays out when you get to um, a digital medium like a computer game, which is essentially uh, a complex relationship with a database, right? That, that, that has algorithms at play that are, that are slightly, obviously more complicated, but it also has a way of mediating your relationship with database entries. And, and, and so the pronoun shift there um, creates a kind of different aesthetic relationship, you know, whether it's the reader who is, um, incorporating entries and, and, and having the choice and agency or whether it's the author who is doing that in the case of Whitman. So there, there's a there's just an interesting way in which um, the same questions come up historically regarding the relationship between like the technological affordances, the materiality of inscription, but then also like the cultural algorithms I was thinking about um, the paper on Stoney and Amy's paper, you know, the ways in which like a lot, a lot of like the cultural algorithms of like paper patterns as well, like to think of them as kind of like a media that is incorporating a set of instructions to people, right? And, the, and, and that people are performing those instructions as well. So it's just interesting how like we, we, we gain better vocabulary for all of these things as, as, and now chat GPT comes along and we're going to probably gain even better vocabulary how to understand all this stuff, right? Or we'll get ag ag algorithmically stuck in the same vocabulary over and over in endless yeah, cycles. Yeah. But maybe they'll tweak that for 4.0. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to the sort of anxieties of 
um, objectification and like being perceived. So this is a sort of, this presentation was a little bit of a spinoff. So my, my actual research and work is on um, classical beauty. So not just aesthetics, but the body beautiful and particularly the black Venus. Um, and so the whole sort of question, the whole research question is like, is there a way to reclaim beauty that isn't just reinscribing objectification? Is there any way to access beauty outside of being objectified? Um, and so one of the things that comes to mind when I read all of these things is uh, Audre Lorde's, you know, can the master's tools ever dismantle the master, master's house, right? To what extent? Um, or uh, Adrian Rich talking about, especially when we're thinking about Phyllis Wheatley Peters, like English is the language of the colonizer, but I needed to talk to you. <laughs> is what um, she says. And so I think we see these movements intellectually back and forward between people feeling very much like it is possible to sort of like use a classical tradition to claim a classical tradition, to reclaim it and repurpose it and reimagine it and do all of these wonderful things with it. And then we see other like sort of cultural moments where people are saying like, well, no, it's not possible. It's actually just reinscribing um, the sort of scaffolding of oppression, uh, particularly white supremacist patriarchy that already exists. Um, we're much more in the latter of that right now, I mm -hmm. think is the sort of intellectual moment is that there is no, um, but I think to be, for me, I, like I think it would be very dismissive to say that like, Obviously, white supremacy and white supremacist logic was constantly trying to transfigure, not succeeding because that's not possible, but constantly trying to transfigure Black women into objects and legally, legally at least succeeding with Phyllis Wheatley Peters, right? Legally, that is mm -hmm. that was what she was. And I think it would be remiss not to think of the sort of the avenues that cla her classicism the ways in which that allowed her even legally to transform is like, that's a huge thing. To be emancipated as an enslaved person is a huge thing. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated, especially for, for Phyllis Wheatley Peters, who has also had a very interesting intellectual history of her reception um, uh, in the sort of field of African-American studies. I'm reminded of the work in Native American Indigenous studies, particularly that of Scott Lyons and this concept of the X mark um, this ascent to a future, right? Um, it's, it's an agentive choice, but, you know, oftentimes between a rock and a hard place. And uh, just because you have a classical tradition that uh, many people deploy in ways that re-objectify her, right, in the act of interpretation, it doesn't mean that you don't right. take your shot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think there are people now doing very important work to also be like this classical tradition the idea that the classical tradition belongs to white people is a sleight of hand of white supremacy and actually isn't true and that there are lots of particularly North African people, but people from all over the continent of Africa that have a very real stake in the classical tradition because of Mediterranean trade um, and that mm -hmm. way antiquity worked. <laughs> yeah, it occurs to me too that whether it's genre convention, of a controller for a game system, uh, they're both like sites of interaction, right? And so genre media too, and then just a helpful reminder. We have a hand up. Uh, I hope you, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Golson Siftsi. Hi. Please go ahead. Um, sorry, my internet connection is not good enough to turn my camera on. Um, thank you very much. These are all very interesting <clears throat> presentations. I do have a question to, uh, for Craig. Um, so um, it was very interesting to listen to your understanding of sort of your approach to new forms of literary sort of reading practices and how interactive text. I hope my background is not really so disturbing. Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. So how, um, as you said, interactive text creating new forms of reading or approaches to literary texts and textual analysis. Um, and I was wondering if you see a role played by affects and affectivity in that too, especially when you think about these sort of like um, interlinked, hyperactive and so on um, forms of text that are becoming very dominant, but also highly um, visual forms of text too. Um, and I wondered if you looked at it sort of through the lens of affect or from that perspective as well. Uh, you did mention affects in passing, but you didn't elaborate on that. So I was very curious to hear if you had anything to say about that, because when I when I think about digital economies and digital ecologies um, in relation to literature, um, I cannot help but think about 
it through the lens of ethics um, and how they sort of manipulate and use them. So I wondered if you have something to say about it. You're muted, I think. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That always happens to me. Um, I was going to say I have too much to say. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of great scholarship um, with the intersection between game studies and affect theory. So, I mean, one way of reading games, whether it's interactive fiction or, or video games, is as um, kind of machines for producing affect, you know, so or, or to think about the ways in which mechanics are allowing certain kinds of actions, but they're also allowing every action that you create, you know, has a kind of complementary affect that circulates with it. So given the kind of physiological reflex oriented nature of so many video games, um, the circulation of affect becomes really, really a key component. So hundred percent. I mean, what, what I was, what I was getting at in passing is in the ways I, I've been struck by how many of the adaptations that students do of earlier texts zero in on the kind of effective dimensions of the text in ways that they're almost like highlighting them and underscoring them and amplifying them through um through the affordances of interaction that are they're already there but they're also but it's also revealing to me that students themselves are finding early literary text successful through an effective register which you know also calls up the, the whole the whole idea of the method wars that are going on right now in literary studies, or if they're still going on, who knows, right? But I mean, this idea of you know moving beyond forms of critique into um, ways of reading that are attuning ourselves to different kinds of affects, I think is really really interesting. Um, I think it has limitations too. I mean, I I try to I try to kind of I kept thinking as everybody was talking about like the role of a lot, of, a lot of these discussions of affect and material, materiality come back to allegory in some respects. Like we're, we're essentially kind of allegorizing writing or we're kind of like creating different, different narrative interfaces in which to understand and interpret our relationship with something as fundamental as reading and writing. So the role of metaphor um, becomes a kind of vehicle toward affect, but the role of metaphor also becomes a tool for critical interpretation and, and allows us to kind of excavate different layers of the history of reading and writing, I think is really, really interesting. Um, but 100%, I'm, I'm all for thinking about affect. Um, and I don't know what I said made any sense, but I'm just rambling. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you're doing your dance there. I loved it. Um, so Craig, we have a question in the chat for you, and I'll give you a moment to uh, think on that. Uh, at the same time, I want to ask um, Emma a question. So I noticed uh, in your lovely paper, a uh, set of moments that you closely read where there's this embodied interaction with books, with, with Bibles. And I was wondering if you might reflect just more generally on how your experience of reading books that represent the embodied performance of the ghost stance, like how that creates opportunities, but also maybe productive limits uh, for understanding how that embodied performance was interpretively resonant as biblical exegesis to the dancers, to particular audiences. Like, what are the opportunities for representing dances in books and what are the limits of doing so um, for your own interpretive work or work that you've seen elsewhere on the ghost dance? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, I think it, that the idea of the ghost dance is such a visually um, promising image that's like, even while I was writing, my advisor was saying like, is there an image of this? Is there any photographs or anything like that? And there, there actually were like, um, uh, Mooney wrote a, an early anthropological study of the ghost dance and he includes um, some some images. And, um, and then uh, there were a few in some less, some more racist depictions of the ghost dance in like popular fiction as well. But the interesting thing in um, Callahan's book is that she talks a lot about the phenomenon of the ghost dance, how it shows up in the media, kind of its reputation, and just the general premise that Native Americans should be able to have their own messiah, and why is the government trying to stop that? But she doesn't actually show anyone dancing. 
uh, she skips over that part, which I think is very interesting for her. But then when you go to Leslie Marmon Silco, she does show this dancing. She does show kind of the, the, way, the more spiritual encounters with, that people have the ability to fall into trances and reunite with the ancestors and capturing that movement. But it definitely is difficult from a genre perspective to capture movement in novels. And I wish that Callahan had um, taken a, a shot at it. And so I could see more comparatively her, her take on that versus Silco's. But, um, but it's interesting that she kind of talks about it more as a, I guess, um, kind of a articles of belief, like a statement of belief instead of a dance. And then Silco is looking at it as a dance that's spiritually significant. Yeah, though I suspect, I mean, you know, I want to go read Callahan now and there's probably all sorts of little moments of fissure and friction where the, you know, obviously, you know, this kind of like erasure of the embodied performance of the dance probably ramifies throughout the text actually, right? This con yeah. we'll call it conspicuous absence. Um, and trying to write about a thing without writing about the thing usually kind of yeah. reveals itself as a return of the repressed. But how that actually manifests in the novel, I, I'd be curious to learn. Um, actually, it's the shot in the dark, of course. So I just remembered something that hadn't really occurred to me because the earlier part of the novel is so separate to me that I sometimes forget about it. There actually was an earlier scene where she doesn't describe the ghost dance per se, but she does describe a um, indigenous dance for the for Wainima's tribe mm -hmm. and um, talks about everyone dancing. Her main character is actually a white missionary who's recently arrived at the tribe. And so she's very judgmental of the dance. And then she meets another Methodist missionary who's saying, no, it's okay. We should let them have their practices and they're, they're not hurting anyone. Why are we trying to restrict that? And I think thematically that ties very well into the ghost dance. It's hard to figure out temporally like if she wrote that before the ghost dance even happened, while there was kind of just more of that media presence of the ghost dance, or if it was um, or before that, before Woundedney happened. But um, it's interesting to see that kind of depiction of uh, dances. And then he, and then um, the Methodist missionary even talks about how these Native American dances are in many ways more. Um, I don't know if a good word for it. I guess more more civilized, more civil than southern dances like balls and galas and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, it sounds like an amazing opportunity. And of course, you know, thinking in term, in uh, thinking of you know a privileging of continuous genealogies of knowledge, just because something depicting uh, the ghost dance a hundred years later is a hundred years later does not mean it is like problematically anachronist. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite, potentially. Um, we have uh, another comment in the chat for Grace, but Craig, first, I wonder if you could reflect on the question from, well, the account that says the ANS Dean's office. Um, I'll be quick, because I know I want to let Grace answer how sure. to answer that question too. But um, I mean, it's a compli it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, on the one hand, I wish I had more time to work with all of these students in expanding their experiments. Um, you know, we have a, a fledgling digital humanities center here at USM, which is barely surviving. I mean, it just started. Um, so we're just kind of trying to create an infrastructure that might allow us to actually make these things work more. So they're very much kind of prototypes. But um, to answer your question, I mean, what, one of the things that a game has struggles with is the narrative components of a story like Bartleby the Scrivener, which you know relies so much upon the narrator, who in, in, in the case of the story, the narrator subsumes Bartleby within this elaborate story and immortalizes him, so to speak, you know, through kind of um, literary culture. So what works in the game is kind of it, it doesn't really deal with that. But whatever, from what I remember, you know, some mechanics that it focused on it was it, it focused on kind of the spatial dynamics of the office. So it allowed an interaction with. Um, with walls and platforms in a kind of interesting way. And another thing was they actually incorporated like a meter of exhaustion. So like every time you responded with that prefer not to, like the meter went down and you eventually just died. Right. So it was, it was a short, I mean, it was not a long playable experience. And most of these, these experiments that students are creating, you know, given the constraints that they have in a class that I have to still cover all of American literature <laughs> until 1865. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a ridiculous survey that I have to teach. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just really interesting. And, you know, just 
but that's the answer to the question. I would say like the, the way it was engaging with space, I found really, really interesting. And then the meter we talked, I, I remember talking with the student and kind of implementing a meter that kind of gave you a con kind of constraint, but also a visual representation that Bartleby was getting more and more exhausted from the confinement of the space. Um, so th that's, how, that's how I would answer that question quickly. Great, thank you, Greg. Uh, and Grace, you have a question here from Laura Rana who is asking about the uh, scholarly opportunities, scholarly engagement by people working on contemporary African-American studies and African-American literature, how that uh, you have found useful in your engagement with early American texts um, or contemporary black literature's engagement with early American texts as well. Maybe you could reflect briefly. Yeah, um, I have lots of thoughts on this, Laura. So we could also link up later or something. But as somebody who doesn't have a classical background and who studies classicism, like I don't have any Latin or Greek, like I didn't go to that kind of school. I don't know about what y'all's education was like, but that was not mine. Um, I feel like there's an element of, of studying stuff. Sometimes it's more about like what is what is in the culture, because some of the people who I study, they also didn't have any Latin or Greek, but they're responding to myth. Um, and sort of like they're responding to the sort of cultural well-known um, elements of that. So I think there's an element of that. It's a little bit difficult with Jeffers because she took like she talks in interviews. She took like 10 years to write this book and she like went to like a million archives and she like did all of this sort of like background. But I think there's an element of like if you're responding to the sort of cultural memory of Wheatley Peters, which Jeffers is also doing as well as drawing in the archival um, there's an element of like just positioning yourself to be able to tease that out. And then also like my advice as with everything is just collaborate, 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 just find yourself some early American, <laughs> early Americanists and be friends with them. And my time period for my dissertation is literally 1773 to 2021. So <laughs> there's, um, uh, there's a lot of people here. I'm like tap tapping into their expertise. I'm not just relying on my own. I think uh, feminist epistemology of the network is always a great note to end on. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, all four of you, for wonderful papers. And we're going to continue the conversation on Saturday. Again, reach out to me, if you haven't already, for a Zoom link from my personal account. And I'll go rogue and Zoom uh, sessions two and three of American Afterlives. Thank you so much. And we'll see you down the dusty trail. So long. Thank you all. See you on Saturday.